are really blessed. This boat has been the central part of our lives. You know, there's something about having your food, your water, your bedding and dry clothes and a warm place to sleep. And you're this little space capsule going over the ocean. I was a single guy living in a trailer uh, in Yukulit. But I was an apprentice shipwright and I knew I wouldn't be able to afford to buy a boat. And I had had a sailing adventure with my brother in the South Pacific a few years earlier, and we both decided that we wanted to go back to sailing on the ocean. It was really exciting. I was still an apprentice, but I started building Sombrio in 1983. And it's about 85% salvage lumber. A few pieces I bought, but most of it's uh, either off the beach that I would mill with an Alaska mill, or the logging companies would let you go up into the slash on the weekends with a firewood permit and I would get a firewood permit and I would go up with my Alaska mill and cut timbers that they had left behind. They had already declared the logging done. So a lot of the timbers in Sombrio are curved pieces of wood that grew with the curve in them and I was able to slab them and take advantage of that curve. All the ribs are yew wood, which is unconventional because it wasn't a commercially harvested wood but it actually is very rot resistant and makes for very good ribs. I didn't bankroll it. I didn't have a sum of money and I wasn't able to just take off a chunk of time to work on Sombrio. I had a day job and so I was working uh, for the shipyard during the day and building Sombrio at night and evenings and weekends for 10 years plus. So Sombrio was built on the beach and launch day we took out the front of the shop and with anchors we dragged it out onto the mud flats and let the tide come in and float it out of the cradle. But it took a long time because life got in the way and we lost our dad, we lost two sisters and I gained a son in the time it took to build the boat. And at the same time I met Sandy. We were picking away at working on the down below. We rented this place. It got sold. We got evicted. We rented another place. We put in a garden. We said to the guy when we got there, you're not planning to sell this house? We said, oh no. Within 14 months, we came home and found real estate agents wandering around. And by then, we worked so hard on these two places and Kim really wanted to live on the boat. And I was like, what are you even talking about? I can't even <laughs> imagine it. When we got evicted for the second time, I said, okay, let's talk about this living on the boat thing because I am sick and tired of this. And I, I don't understand how anybody can live on a boat. How on earth do you actually do this? We just really put a lot of effort into just getting the down below ready for us to live aboard. So Robbie could have his bunk in here and, and the galley was all set up and a place for us to sleep. There was still no mast, no engine. We were now just fully living aboard, and that's a whole other thing, living Sandy in a marina. Sandy said she'd try it for a year. I said one year. Anyway, so seven years later, anyway, <laughs> it was just a teeny tiny apartment floating on the water. And we finally and started a little bit in the summertime. We were actually mobile and we could take the kids. We went all through the Gulf Islands and little, little trips. And uh, yeah, my learning curve was very steep. It was hard when we lived on the boat and we both had full-time jobs. That was tough. We realized we couldn't both get up in the morning at the same time and leave <laughs> yeah. for work. So we figured out a rhythm that worked. Mm -hmm. And and to this day, we still have to rise and go to bed in a different way than we do at home. So we are living in, on the boat for, for the seven years. And then we ended up moving into a house so that we could look after my father. So then it was just summertime for us on the boat when we could. And then Kim's brother, the one he'd gone sailing with in the South Pacific, got cancer at 60. And we're looking at each other going, the whole reason you built this boat in the first place was to take another trip to the South Pacific. And if we don't do it, it's not going to happen because we are now officially getting old. So as of the summer of 2015, we just threw as many resources as we could into getting the boat ready for the big trip to the South Pacific and back. 
and we did. And I had huge family trip. help me with some of the legs yeah. down the coast. I did some of the sailing on my own uh, in California, and Sandy flew into the Marquesas and joined me there. And from there, Sandy did over 3,500 sea miles of fantastic ocean sailing. And we left August 2017 and came back August 2019. We were so lucky because we told ourselves at any point the doors could close. Our health could give out, uh, things could go bad at home, anything could happen to shut the thing down. And the doors just stayed open. And so we kept sailing and sailing. Uh, yeah, it was really spectacular in terms of travel. I mean, we were the Beverly Hillbillies out there. Yeah. Uh, people who are cruising are mostly on really fancy yachts yeah. with water makers and electric winches for raising the anchor, winches for raising the sails. They have power everything and they can operate it all from the cockpit, whereas we're very physical. But that also meant that when we got to some place, we didn't have to fix all those systems. I can fix most of the rigging myself. I can fix most of the things that break on this boat myself, yeah. which is really fortunate. Not everybody can do that. So here's our wonderful galley. We've got the, a little bar sink. That's all we really need. And we have a lip along here to keep things from rolling off when you're cooking. At sea, you gotta like lower your center of gravity. Make sure you cut round things in half so they don't roll away on you. We've got a foot pump for fresh water. And then over here, we have a salt water pump. And um, we don't use that in harbors, but if we're at sea or in a clean place for rinsing off our dishes, so we save our fresh water. And we've got all our non-perishable foods up in here. All our dishes are in these drawers that are all latched, so they don't come flying out. We've got a lift and pull. And down here in cold water, that's a larder. In the South Pacific, it's not. Um, little curtains to keep everything in. There's garbage and buckets and whatnot. And then, of course, the most wonderful wood stove that keeps us warm. Pots and pans are down in here. And uh, so cans are under the seats. All kinds of uh, drink cans and there's water tanks over here. In severe conditions, Sandy has had to strap herself in with a long seat belt that goes from the closet to this hook here, and it allows her to work with both hands, leaning against her whole body weight against the safety belt. It allows you to go full length all the way to here, because there are a couple of drawers you want to get at here. It allows you to get at the stove, and you can lean all your body weight against it and still work with both hands. We also have a single burner methyl hydrate stove that uh, is non-explosive, um, but we boil a lot of water and Sandy does a lot of cooking on that in the summertime. Um, and this is what hangs in the gimbal mechanism here at sea. This swings back and forth, or fore and aft as well, all at the same time with a pot or a kettle on there. Mm -hmm. In here we have the head and more storage, lots of tool space. And up forward, we have the bunk. <laughs> uh, the bunk is six foot six long and six foot six wide, but it's pie shaped, so our feet are together at uh, the forward end. You can't fall but out of bed. You can't fall out. It's a lovely, large double bed. Yeah, there's uh, portholes that open, so there's lots of ventilation. There's a forward hatch, which allows us to come and go through the forward hatch as well. It's an emergency exit, but it also lets in air when the conditions are right. On a boat, you just try and take advantage of every conceivable nook and cranny. So there's doors and drawers and lockers everywhere with our food and our clothing and our tools. The step up to the forward bunk is actually my mechanics tools and my woodworking tools. Even though we've got uh, 50 gallons of water stored below deck. You still have to have jerry cans because quite often you get to places where there isn't a hose at the dock or there is no dock and you're anchored and you're running short of water. If you haven't been able to catch rainwater, you've got to go for water. So taking jerry cans wherever you go to collect more water is important. We've got 50 gallons of fuel. We have a 26 horsepower three cylinder Isuzu diesel uh, under a cover there and 
it can push this along at about five knots in calm water burns about uh, half a gallon an hour of fuel we have two hundred watt solar panels one on each side of the boat that are adjustable angle wise so uh, on a good sunny day we can generate quite a bit of electricity the boat is wired set up with uh, outlets for both uh, 110 and uh, 12 volts so we have a 12 volt fridge that runs when the engine is running and we're, or we're getting lots of solar energy we have uh, shore power where we plug in a heavy wire from the dock to the boat and then there are outlets throughout the boat that allow us to plug in a little space heater to cut down on smoke emission and all that stuff designed by Alan Mason in 1952, he called this design Oceana. They're a double ender, 33 feet long. The hull is uh, planked in red cedar and Douglas fir down near the keel. And the building technique is 300 years old, called carval planking. And it's a lovely way to build a boat if you've got the time, because all the parts of the boat are replaceable without compromising the integrity of the structure. Every material is, uh, has its benefits and is a compromise, depending on what you're after. Like fiberglass and plywood and steel all have condensation issues, especially when you're living on board in the wintertime, whereas wood is a, a very good natural insulator. So between a space heater and our wood stove, we're warm and dry here. And part of that is thanks to the wood. The work that you have to do every year can be overwhelming sometimes. Like we always feel like Sombrio can get ahead of us, you know, depending on how our year has been and how much effort we've been able to put into it. But not everything gets painted every year. Most of the varnish and bright work down below is all original. There's been no painting and varnishing. But as soon as you go outside, the sun is just so hard oh, on yeah. everything. It's hard on paint too, but the paint does last much longer. This wooden boat has a spirit and a soul and has looked after us and I thank Sombrio every day for the, the safe travel that she's given us. Please share this video if you liked it. Also be sure to subscribe to Exploring Alternatives and check out our playlists for more stories like this. Thanks for watching.